I do that because I like to have mean looks back while I'm preaching. And, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord, man. It's great to sing as a church. Amen? Amen. Hey, if you didn't get a chance to grab one of these, they're on your way out. There's some uh, scripture reading, uh, reading plans for the year if you want to read through. And I know you're a couple uh, days behind, but you can catch up. And if you've never read through your Bible in a year... I would really encourage you to do it. There's several plans. You can do a chronological reading, or this one is kind of broken up just as, uh, as it is uh, delineated out in the regular order. And so you can grab that. It has the days. And so you can use this one. There's lots of ones that you can get. But I would really encourage you to read. If you've never read the Bible through in a year, it would be awesome. And a couple years ago, I guess it's been, man, seven, eight years ago, yeah, maybe not that long, we did the 100-day challenge. Read the Bible in 100 days. And man, everybody that participated in that just thought it was amazing when you take that much scripture in at one time, how clear of a picture that you get. Because sometimes we're so focused on a particular verse, we forget there's an overall uh, concept through each of, those, each of those books. So I'd really encourage you to grab one of those. Also out there, there's a flyer for the uh, Run for Restoration, which is February 2nd. And... Uh, uh, that's a, uh, a 5K that Marianne puts on with her honor student over at uh, Nature Coast, but it benefits TRC, the Restoration Center. And so there's several ways that you can help and participate in that. One, you can sign up and run or walk in the 5K. You know, like, preacher, I don't run. Join the crowd. Uh, you, can, you can walk. There will be, there'll be numerous walkers. Uh, also, if you could, when you see that on, on like Facebook or social media, if you share that uh, and you get it out into the community, that would also be a blessing uh, to help. And if you want to set up a, a vendor table or something like that, uh, see Marianne. And if you want to just help, we'll have some, some folks out there helping. Uh, then you can see us and we can, that would also be a blessing. But the best way to participate is to participate. To get in and then communicate that with other people. Take one of those, a bunch of flyers out there and take that. To, you know there's one of those crazy peoples at your work that likes jogging. Okay, take it to them. Okay, and, uh, and that would be a great way to introduce them. Say, hey, this is a ministry our church is doing and connected with the, with the high school over there. And who knows what other uh, conversation opportunities it would give you. Uh, to start a conversation in that way. So uh, please participate in that if you would. And, um, and next Sunday night, we're kind of, uh, to, we're kind of um, putting some things in order for this, for this year. Uh, to, be, to be honest, we're kind of, uh, how do I, I guess I'm just going to be honest. I suppose that's okay. Um, we're, we're kind of a little bit of a transition. Brother Corey and Gorsier are going to be heading out the beginning of February to take the church there in Kansas. And, and uh, we're, we're, we're bitter and excited about that at the same time. And uh, so we're kind of juggling things in the air, but there's some things that I'd like to, to be able to do this next year that starting next Sunday night, I'm going to try to roll out just some concepts of how we can take our faith into action. Okay? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. And uh, so we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. So take your Bibles, please, if you would, and turn to the book of Luke. Luke, uh, I'm sorry, Luke, what am I talking about? Uh, uh, Mark, please turn to the book of Mark. My Bible was in Luke and it confused my brain. Uh, turn to the book of Mark as we're going through the book of Mark on uh, Sunday nights. And, and about two months ago, I dealt with this particular passage and said, hey, we're going to be back here when we're going through the book of Mark. Well, we're back. And uh, talking about uh, this end of chapter number one. And so let me read it to you, beginning in verse number 39, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. The Bible says, And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. And there, came to, uh, and there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed, and he straightly charged him, and sent a sergeant forthwith, and sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, 
and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it and to blaze, uh, blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, that you would, you would help us understand the, the truth of Scripture and the application of Scripture, Lord. And though the varied situations may be different, the truth remains the same. And the need that we have to know you and to know your touch in our life. Lord, and I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage, as Jesus is now making his way, we've seen him interact with those that are in, had physical needs. Okay? And so the question arises. This is kind of a, a theological philosophy question uh, that Jesus did much for the physical benefit of those he came in contact with. We already know that he had, had, had cast out the demon, that, or the spirit that was in the, the evil spirit that was in this man in this chapter. We already know that he healed uh, Peter's mother in law. And uh, as, as they prayed for her and, and they brought her to Jesus, we talked about that. And now we see that he has healed a lot of other people. And now this leper is coming to him and healing him. And so the question is Jesus is doing all this benefit, he's doing all this physical benefit for the people he comes in contact with. So we have to ask our question, is that the primary reason for Jesus' interaction with them? Is that the primary reason for Jesus' interaction? And this particular case gives us an inkling, gives us an idea of ultimately uh, what is the purpose for this interaction. Okay, What is the reason for this interaction? Because to be honest with you, if the primary purpose of Jesus was the restoration of the physical body, then the rest of the New Testament should have been instructions on how we do healing. Okay, now, don't get me wrong. He is the great physician. And he can heal and he can perform miracles as he will. And man, I, I know that you've seen those and I've seen those Miracles where God restored somebody physically. God gave somebody years added on to their life physically. And it's an incredible, it's a miraculous thing where the doctor says this. And the next time they go back, the doctor says, I don't know what happened, but it's not there anymore. Amen. And I say, praise the Lord. God is able and God can do it. But can I give you this? It is not his main goal for the restoration of the physical body. Okay, here's the reason. It is a temporary fix. It is a temporary fix. Now, praise the Lord, it can be a blessing. <laughs> I, I'm okay with some temporary fixes. And so if somebody's going through uh, health issues or somebody's going through difficulty, man, the Bible still says it is the prayer of the faith that saves the sick. And it calls the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, lay hands on them, and pray for them, and for the prayer of faith saves the sick. And so we should be obedient to the Lord when it comes to praying for the physical needs that people have. Also, we should be aware that it is within our power, and we should be caring for people's physical needs. In fact, the Bible says this in the book of James, that pure and undefiled religion is that you care for the fatherless and the widows. Well, how do you think you're going to care for them? Well, the instructions that are given to us, both in the book of Hebrews, also in the book of Timothy, when you're caring for the widows and you're caring for the fatherless, is first and foremost, care for their needs. They have needs. Those are temporal needs, and those are physical needs, and those are sometimes uh, financial needs. And, and that should be a part of what we do, is to care for people's needs, and, and is to uh, be a blessing to them, and, and try to be a help to them. But that is not the primary purpose for an interaction that Jesus has with a person. It's not the primary purpose. Because ultimately it is a temporary solution to a problem that's just going to recur. Okay, I'm just going to tell you the reality. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this the judgment. Okay? And so we know that this body is breaking down. Friends, we know this body is breaking down. Right? 
I, I used to could preach that 20 years ago, and I, I was like, I'm sure, you know, you guys know your body's breaking down. I no longer say that. I know that the body is breaking down. That's just the reality of the physical world that we live in. And to ultimately, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 5, and verse number 12, the reason that the decay and death entered into the world was because of sin. Sin is the destructive force that brings death into the world and death by sin, for death passed upon all men, for all have sinned, it says in Romans 5.12. So ultimately, the reason there is this decay, the reason there is uh, this destruction, the Bible tells us that even the earth groans under the weight of the fall. And so we know those things are happening. So when we look at the scriptures and we see this interaction, especially with this leper man, it was a blessing, it was an incredible blessing that there was a physical benefit, uh, a, a restoration, a healing in this man's life. But can I tell you what the ultimate end of his life was? He lived, then he died. Now he lived longer, praise the Lord, because Jesus healed it. So there is a value in, in, in asking prayer and asking God to heal us, asking God uh, to use wisdom and help us, but there is a greater importance that should come away from our contact with Jesus than just a physical benefit. Now, we could also apply this not just to a physical benefit. Man, I'll tell you, it is a blessing that if you, uh, if you rear your children according to God's word, there's going to be a benefit. If you live your marriage according to God's word, there's going to be a benefit. But can I be honest with you? The primary benefit of your relationship with Christ is not a peaceful home. That's not the primary benefit. Now, praise the Lord, that is an, an incredible benefit that comes from it. Amen. But the primary benefit, the primary reason for you to come in contact with Jesus Christ is so that you can have a relationship with him, so that your sins can be forgiven, and so that you have an eternal relationship with him. And the Bible says that I am given everlasting life. That's something that transcends the physical difficulties because ultimately my spirit shall live on. That's why Paul can say, and we just met with, for Mrs. Uh, George's memorial service and said, oh grave, where is thy victory? Oh death, where is thy sting? Okay, because the truths of the scripture is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the Old Testament and Psalms can say, Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Because the primary reason that I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is because I have been restored unto him and I am his child and I have been given everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, and his righteousness. That's the primary reason. So even when we look at this scripture, even though there is this obvious benefit to the man with leprosy having healing, there is also a spiritual value or a spiritual lesson that we can learn in this, and Jesus will actually make reference to it. So let's look at what it says and, and the reason for it. So he's, this leper comes to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Can I tell you that is a great declaration of faith? Amen. Okay. It was not that the... Now, you're gonna, if you study the Old Testament, you're going to find that leprosy is always a picture of sin. Leprosy does to the body what sin does to the life. Okay? Leprosy starts on the inside, and leprosy actually starts in the bones and ultimately is made evident in the skin. We see it as a skin issue, but ultimately it starts internally and works externally. Well, so does sin. Sin is something that works on the inside and then ultimately affects the outside. Okay? Leprosy destroys the body over time, incrementally. It destroys the body, and so sin will destroy our life. Okay? There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death, the Bible tells us. And so we see that this man comes and he is in a broken down condition, physically and spiritually, and he gives a declaration of faith, and he says, If thou will, Thou canst make me clean. Okay? 
And that's really what salvation is. Salvation is coming to the Lord who died for us, who was buried, who rose again the third day, and come in our broken down sinful condition and say, Lord, if you'll forgive me, I know you can. I know you can. And guess what the scripture says? If we ask, he will forgive. Okay? And it, but it's more. It's more than just the forgiveness of sins. It's important that we understand this. Sometimes we, we teach salvation so contractually, so, so transactionally. Don't you want your sins forgiven? But salvation is much more than the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Salvation is the restoration of a relationship. Amen. Okay? It's the restoration of a relationship. So can you think about it in this way? Because often salvation is given in terms Salvation is given terms of parent-child. And so I have a child, let's say, uh, who has defied me and says, I, can't, I, I don't want anything to do with you, and they've gone away from me. And then they said, oh man, what did I do? I, I can't believe I did that. I wish my dad would forgive me, right? And so they call me up on the phone and they say, Dad, will you forgive me? And I said, surely I'll forgive you. Well, can I come home? No. No, I don't want anything to do with you. I mean, I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to let you back into my home. Okay, well, praise the Lord for forgiveness, but what we need is a restored relationship. Okay, and salvation is more, it's so important we understand this, salvation is more than just knowing God or even benefiting from God. You know a lot of people have benefited from God? Because God is gracious. God has been there for them. God has helped them. God has cared for them. God has done many things for them. It's rained upon the just and the unjust. God has protected them at times. And they say, oh, God's done a lot for me. That's awesome. But that doesn't mean you have a restored relationship with him. It just means he is a gracious God. So it's more than just forgiveness of sins. When I ask Christ to to be my Lord and Savior and to forgive me of my sins because I'm in desperate need of it. When I ask him to be my Lord and Savior and forgive me of my sins, he does more than just make a transaction. Okay, fine, you're no longer guilty. The Bible says that to me gave he power, John chapter number one, to become the sons of God. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To become, it's not just forgiveness, but it's to be forgiven and to be restored. And the Bible even uses the word justified. It is even more than being pardoned. It is just as if I've never sinned. It's not that I just don't have to pay for the sin. It is as if I've never sinned because the sin's been paid for. It was paid for by Christ upon the cross who bore the sin of all mankind. In fact, the Bible says he became the sin of all mankind. And so salvation. Now, if that's the relationship that I have with Christ, if I know that there has been a time that I have, and Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. Okay? You must be born again. Well, that's, that's something that should take place that is based in knowledge, of course, and based in faith. Faith cometh by hearing. hearing. That's knowledge, right? you got to hear it. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Okay? So get the knowledge. You have to know the knowledge first. Somebody says, how do you know that you're, how do you know you're a child of God? How do you know you're going to heaven? Well, you know what I think? I think that if you're good enough, God will let you in. Well, well that's based upon your knowledge, not based upon the Word of God. Because the Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No man will be able to stand before God and say, I did enough for you to let me in. Because it's not about how much is done, it's about the forgiveness of sin. Amen. Okay? No amount of good that you can do can take away the bad. Okay? No, you pay... Ten of your bills and call the bill collector on number 11 and say, listen, I just want you to know, I paid all ten of my other bills. So you should know. You should forgive me my debt 
Because look at all the bills that I did pay. Are they going to forgive your debt? No. No. In fact, when all is said and done, though you pay 10 of them, if you do not pay this one, you're going to be somebody that doesn't pay his bills. Right? And so it's imperative to understand that salvation is not a religious ascent. It's not a creed. It's not a, you know, I think this is a good idea. It is a relationship that begins when I humble myself before God, recognize his authority in my life, and I ask him to forgive me and to be my Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, when he does that, he has quickened us, made us alive who are dead in trespasses and sin. Yes. Now, if that's the case then there should be something that we're talking about it on Sunday morning, so I'm just kind of continuing the message. There should be something that affects the outside because of what has taken place on the inside. Okay? Now, for sometimes we mispreach this. We preach that if you want to change the outside, or the inside, then just change the outside. Okay? No, 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 that, that's not how you do it. Okay? First, there has to be a recognition, a salvation that takes place in the heart. Amen. Then there has to be a willingness to follow the Lord. Because what we don't want to do is to have a poor testimony. Here's the reason. Because if we have salvation, praise the Lord that we have salvation. But even, if we saw, even as we saw in the video, there's a lot of people that need to know that there's a relationship with God available. There's a relationship with God available. Who's supposed to tell them? Who's supposed to lovingly, graciously tell them that they must be born again? It's supposed to be us. And there's supposed to be a, a difference in our life. So look at what it says with this leper. It says this. It says, he comes with this declaration of faith. If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion put forth his hand and touched him. Now, let me just, real quick, that's pretty amazing. What was the one thing that you weren't supposed to do with a leper? To touch him. And here's the reason that Jesus touched him. He was letting, he was letting him and his disciples and everybody know, listen, my power is greater than the power of leprosy. Okay? My power is greater than the power of sin. Somebody comes to God and they say, oh, but I'm so sinful and I'm so wayward and I'm so wicked, there's no way that God can save me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not maximizing your sin. You're minimizing the power of God. And God has compassion even on one whose life has been completely uh, tattered by sin to the point that he's not afraid to reach out and commune with the one who is the most broken. Okay? Think about what he said to the woman that was taken in adultery. She was taken in adultery, the very act the Bible says, and these men who had the manipulative motives, they came to Jesus and they were basically trying to trap him and say, well, sh she should be stoned according to the law. And Jesus was helping them understand that they also were guilty. And he says, he who was without sin... Cast the first stone. And pretty soon, it was pretty evident that none of them were without sin. So what does he say to this woman? He says, where are thine accusers? She, you see her looking around? They've gone. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus doesn't excuse her sin, but he forgives her sin. Okay? Personal contact with somebody that people in that society be like, ooh, I can't have personal contact with them. Now let me just give you a time out. Maybe some of us Christians should learn from the example of Jesus, right? And so if so we see somebody whose life is tattered and broken by sin, first of all, just because their life is tattered and broken by sin, it doesn't mean that we are more righteous than they. It's just sometimes sin is more, depending on the sin, it's more evident on the outside as opposed to being evident on the inside. You know, and sometimes we categorize, well, that's a really, really bad sin. In fact, if you go in the scripture, when Jesus, when, I'm sorry, when God categorizes sin, guess when he, which one he puts first? A proud look. That's the one he puts first. So when we look at somebody, and oh my goodness, 
one of those people. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Be careful. Your sin may be greater with your proud look. What you should be doing is trying to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Amen. Which may mean that you have to have a close enough relationship with them that you can actually share Jesus with them. Okay? And so we have to be looking for that. And, Je and so Jesus touches him. Willing to have this personal contact with him. His power was greater than that of the leprosy. And it says in verse number 42, it says, And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. He said, I will be thou clean. And immediately the lepers cleansed him. The leprosy cleansed him. Now, when you're, can, you picture this, can you picture this in your mind? What would a person with leprosy look like? Okay. He's probably not wearing the latest fashion. Right? He's probably not well kept. Not because he, he is lazy. He is actually an outcast. He has to live outside of the city. He would not have access to even the amenities that would be available in those cities. Okay? He would not have, be able to have family contact. He would have to come down the street and proclaim, unclean, unclean, so that there would not be personal contact with other people, so that the disease would not be spread, and people would step over to the other side. He would not have the ability to readily bathe like everybody else, the readily ability to get uh, clothing like everybody else, to get groomed like everybody else. He probably looked a mess. Clothes tattered and torn. Not just that, but how the leprosy affects the physical body and, and those sores and, and, and the fingers. But immediately, when God says, you're cleansed, the leprosy departed. And, and my, this is my personal, it doesn't exactly tell us, but this is what I believe. The leprosy departed and there would be no sign of the leprosy. But he's, can you, he still looks like a leper. So Jesus tells them something interesting. Look what it says. It says, And straightway he charged him and sent him forth, and sent him forth, uh, forthwith sent him away, saying unto him, See, thou sayest nothing to any man, but go thy way and show thyself to the priests and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded. He says, I want you to go away. Don't tell anybody what's happened. Well, can you imagine that for a minute? You've just been cleansed of leprosy. Don't tell anybody. You haven't had personal contact with your family since the disease came. You've not been able to give uh, uh, your, your wife a hug or pick up your children or have any, live with your family. You've not had any personal contact. There's been no expression uh, of intimacy, nothing, since the disease came. And Jesus says, now I don't want you to go tell anybody. That's a strange statement. But he says, I want you to go and show yourself to the priest and perform the commandments of the law of Moses. Well, why would he do that? Well, without going into much uh, going back, you can read it. Leviticus chapter number 13, 14 and 15, talk about the laws of leprosy. What to do when, you're face, when you, there's a cleansing of leprosy. The funny thing is we don't have a lot of evidences of a lot of cleansing of leprosy. We have Laban who was cleansed. We have the lepers that Jesus cleansed. And that's about it. That's about it. And so here's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to go into the priest. The first thing they're supposed to do is they're supposed to offer a sacrifice. That sacrifice is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two turtle doves. One of them is to be killed in an earthen vessel. The other one, the blood is dipped upon the living turtle dove and he's to be set free. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the means of cleansing. Then he's supposed to wait and he's supposed to show himself to the priest and then he's supposed to shave off his head. His hair, shave off his head. I think I said that last time. Shave off his hair. Then he's supposed to shave off his eyebrows. Then he's supposed to shave off his beard. Then he's supposed to shave off all the hair on his body. Why would he do that? Well, in Leviticus it teaches that when there's the cleansing of leprosy, the reason that you shave all this off, even though you're cleansed, there may still be remnants of leprosy within your beard, in your clothes. You know what he's supposed to do with his clothing? Burn them. 
He's supposed to go into his bedding. And he's supposed to have it inspected, cleansed, washed, or burned. He's supposed to go into his house, chapter 15 of Leviticus, and have his house inspected. And if necessary, have the walls scraped to remove all the uh, leprosy. And if that doesn't get enough, tear it down. Man, why? Why would that? Here's the reason. Because a person that has been healed of leprosy should continue and start living a life that reflects a person healed of leprosy. He should not start living. He should not walk down the street and say, unclean. Why? Because he's no longer unclean. He should not go into his, his home and put on those same garments of leprosy. He should not sleep in that same bed filled with leprosy and sleep outside of the town. In fact, in Leviticus tells us after this, all these things have taken place, there's confirmation, he is restored to the city in fellowship. It'd be better to tear the house down than to live in a house that has leprosy in it. So what lesson do we learn from this? Well, first of all, even though he's not going to, if if he obeyed Jesus, now he doesn't obey Jesus, you can hardly blame him, can you? You know, he went and he's like, I've been healed of leprosy. But if he had told nobody and if he had gone to the priest, can you imagine what would have happened? Seven days later, because he would have to wait seven days and that would also uh, allow Jesus to get to where he wanted to go. Seven days later, can you imagine him walking down the city? No eyebrows, no beard, no hair, new clothes. Somebody would have said to him, whoa, what happened to you? Now also think within cultural context. Think what a beard means to a Jewish man, especially here in this first century. Think what the covering in the hair means to a Jewish man. Think what eyebrows means to any man. (laughs) Right? And he's walking down And he has completely transformed. Now, can can we be honest? Was it the shaving of the hair that removed the leprosy? No. Was it the changing of the clothes that removed the leprosy? No. Was it the new bed? No. Was it the new house? No. None of these things removed the leprosy, but because the leprosy was removed, it was expected that he would have new things. In fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17, that when we get saved, we are a new creature. Amen. Behold, all things are passed, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It is an anomaly. It is an anomaly for a person who's been cleansed of leprosy to put on the same garments to sleep in the same disease bed, to live in the same disease house. Now, just like the leprosy represents sin, I'm not telling you to go home and burn your sheets or tear down your house. <laughs> not what I'm telling you to do. Praise the Lord. Okay, I'm not telling you to burn all your clothes. Here's the principle. Jesus tells him, the reason for I, that I want you to do this, look what it says in the passage. The reason I want you to do this in verse number 44 He says, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony to them. So that they could see the transformation that took place on the inside was now made evident on the outside for a testimony to them. And it was a desire. So when somebody saw him and he was in this new condition, no hair and no beard and no eyebrows. And, and they're like, whoa, what happened to you? Do you think he said, yeah, I had to shave my hair, had to shave my beard, had to shave my eyebrows, you know, because I've been miraculously cleansed from leprosy. <laughs> no, of course not. He's like, no, no, I'll tell you what happened to me. This beard that I used to have, used to have leprosy in it. Not anymore. These eyebrows, they had leprosy. And this hair had leprosy. My clothes, they are filled with leprosy. Not anymore. 
and you watch what God's going to do because God's going to give him a new beard. He's going to give him new hair. Now, not, not always does he give the hair back, but sometimes he does. The new eyebrows. And that's the, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Sometimes we think if we give up those things in our life that we're convicted over, that there's just going to be a void. It's just going to be empty. Well, if I, if I know God's convicted me that I shouldn't do that. I know, I know that I, that's not a good testimony. I know that language is not right. And I know that activity is not right. And, and I know that doing that is not right. But uh, I feel like if, if I, if I do, it's just there's going to be a void. No, no. What you're doing is creating a place for something new. Creating a place for something new. And God will create something. And the benefit are multi-dimensional because not only does he give you something new, but as he does, he makes you a testimony for those that see. Of the hope that is within you, made evident outside of you. You know what would be good for some Christians to do as they put their faith and trust God? Smile. Smile. Because God is good. Amen. Yeah, but I got so much to worry about. That's true. But the God that transcends all life is your Father. And so you know that ultimately He's going to take care of it. Let Him make something new in your life. Put a smile on your face. Amen. Put joy in your heart. Well, I know I'm really joyful. It just doesn't show. <laughs> sure. Sure, maybe, it, no, no, maybe, maybe you're clinging on to control of your life when you should give it to the one who's redeemed your life. Give him control. Well, preacher, I just don't want to look like, you know, some crazy oddball. No, no hair, no eyebrows, no beard. Okay, so what did you look like before? You look like a leper. So you'd rather continuing, I'm talking about testimony. Yeah. Praise the Lord that our righteousness are not based upon the beauty of our looks. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> I'm talking about your testimony. What was your testimony before? It was a testimony of a person given to sin. Yes, it may be within the confines of society and culture that if you set all those things aside, yes, it may appear that you look distinct and different and your testimony with the joy in your heart and the smile on your face and, and the contentment in your life, yes, it may be that you're an anomaly. What a great opportunity to tell them why. Because of all the wonderful works that he has done. And so it's like, Jesus saying to us, just like the man with leprosy who was healed, it was going to be noticed in his life. So you who are forgiven and have been restored and have a relationship with me, so it should be evident in your life. And if we're going to do that, we have to be willing to sacrifice and submit for a purpose of being a testimony. Now look at verse 45 and we'll be done. I, I really have a hard time being hard on this guy because he's just been cleansed from leprosy. But look what it says. It says, but he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter the city, but was without in the desert places and they came to him from every quarter. Now, I, I personally don't think that the ultimate goal that Jesus had was that nobody would know the transformation here. Okay, in fact, we have plenty of other places in Scripture when Jesus healed a man or Jesus restored a man who was filled with the, demon, uh, uh, the, the demonic spirits uh, there in the tombs that he told them, go and tell. Go and tell, right? But I think there was something greater here. He wanted his new life to match what he was saying. He wanted his life to match what he was saying. And according to the law, that would have taken seven days of obedience. Seven days. Well, he showed himself to the priest. The priest would then come and inspect him outside of the city and then say, okay, if it doesn't come back in seven days, then we know. 
Man, those would have been an agonizing, perhaps seven days of anticipation. Then he comes back to the priest and the priest says, well, you're cleansed of leprosy. They would have probably had to dust it off what to do because they hadn't had anybody cleanse them. What are they supposed to do? Turtle doves. You know, and then they would have started doing those things. Man, and then every person, especially understand the religious society that he grew up in, right? Guess how many of the Jews knew the law? All of them. All of them knew the law. And how much more of a powerful testimony when he's proclaiming his cleansing and it matched his appearance. It matched his life. His words matched his life. And people would have said, I've been cleansed. Wait a second. But when he comes following the law and he says, I've been cleansed. They're like, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if anybody would do that unless they've been cleansed. And, his, and that's, it's, it's no different for us. Even though we live in, in a completely different culture and, and we don't have, the, obviously, some of the same struggles with certain diseases and we don't have all those issues, we still have a sin problem. And we still have people that need to know, in a, even in a religious context of our country and our society, a religious context, we, we need for them to see people who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that when they share it, it matches their testimony Amen. of their life. And that might mean you have to sacrifice some things. Sacrifice some things. The life that we live with Jesus is a life of growth and change. A life of putting on and putting off. So the question is this. If you've been cleansed from your sins, you know Christ is your Savior. Your home is in heaven. You know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. You have put your faith in Christ. So what's changing? What are you putting off? What are you sacrificing? What are you shaving off so something new can grow in its place? Ah, uh, preacher, I remember a couple years ago I did that. Well, God bless you. Now you're perfect, aren't you? <laughs> no, no. There should be that. And, but what happens is we get content. We get content even with a level of mediocrity. And what we should be doing is saying, no, no, Lord, I'm all yours. If something begins to grow in my life that you are not a fan of, it reminds you of the life that I had before salvation, I gladly give it to you. I gladly give it to you. And I wonder if you sat down with a sheet of paper and said, what have I sacrificed to the Lord? What have I sacrificed? What attitude have I sacrificed to the Lord? You, you may find there's some that you're like, I sacrificed that to the Lord, I picked it back up. I sacrificed it to the Lord, I picked it back up. Yeah, we all struggle. But what have I sacrificed to the Lord? What attitude? What action? What commitment? What have I sacrificed to the Lord? What could I actually put on paper that if somebody were to see me, I'd say, look, I'm different. Well, I don't know, preacher. I'm just trying to do the best I can. No, no, God deals in specifics. And he wants your testimony to be evident, not guessed. And so he's going to be doing a change in your life. So what is it? What is that change? I should be looking for it. You should be looking for it. Oh, preacher, it's all those people out there that need to get right. No, 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 no. It's all the people in here that need to get right. So that when they go out there, they can see somebody that has given their life to Jesus Christ so that they can be draw all men unto them as they lift up Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help.